Hi, ActiveHistory.ca is happy to present a recording of historian Jennifer Bennell's talk, Isolating Undesirables, Prisons, Pollution, and Homelessness in Toronto's Don River Valley, 1860 to 1932. Her talk is part of the History Matters Lecture Series, sponsored by the Toronto Public Library. Please check back on ActiveHistory.ca in the near future for recordings of subsequent talks from the History Matters Lecture Series. Hello, everybody. My kids have given me a cold, <laughs> so um, I'm going to do my best to get through this talk this evening without losing my voice. Jim has had to stand in for me when the last time my kids gave me a cold at a talk he was attending and actually deliver the rest of my talk, so I promised I won't do that to him tonight. In any case, um, I'd like to thank Lisa Rumiel, who's not here this evening, um, for organizing this series, and to Miriam Scribner as well, um, for, for welcoming us to um, this group of historians who's taken part in this series um, to present some of our work. It's, it's, it's nice to have an opportunity to present to, to a public audience. I thought I would begin by giving you a sense of the larger research project I did on the Don River, and then I'll get into the subject matter for this evening. So first of all, you may wonder what exactly environmental history is. And in my approach to the Don River, in thinking about environmental history, I'm thinking about the history of change in that environment over time, so the forces at work in shaping and continuing to shape the valley and the life it sustains as well as the way people have experienced the river valley over time, the interventions they've made to shape it to their needs, and then the river's responses to those interventions. So expected or otherwise, the ways that nature acted as a historical agent and a causal force in the city's history. So it's essentially a cycle that I'm interested in following. Um, the effects that the environment has had on people, the ways that people in turn have affected that environment and the responses of that environment to human alterations. My dissertation as a whole followed the river's history from a place of central significance to the growing town of York, the former name for, for Toronto, to its growing role as a, as a peripheral space at the city's eastern fringe by the late 19th century. So I show how the dawn overall became a place to locate noxious industry, to dump sewage waste, and to house undesirable populations, which is what I'm going to talk about this evening. I then looked at efforts to reclaim the river, and these took a number of different forms, one of them being the 1880s Dawn Improvement Plan, which resulted in that um, characteristic right-angle turn that we, you may be familiar with in the Lower Dawn today with its goal to transform that area into an industrial hub that would be this, this thriving uh, place of industry for the city. Um, I looked another way to reclaim the river I looked at was the 20th century conservation movement from about the 1940s on, which attempted to reclaim the Don as a conservation success story, as an urban wilderness. Um, and those efforts focused on the experiences of... Um, Don Champion and conservationist Charles Sorrell, who some of you may have heard about. Sorrell's books, while they're not here, I'd, I'd encourage you to explore if you're, if you're interested in looking more at the history of the Don. Um, he owned a cottage in the valley from the 1920s to the 1960s and wrote a lot about his experiences as a cottager, as a conservationist, and as a rambler in the valley and the kinds of people that he met on those rambles. <coughs> The book that I'm working on out of the dissertation will also include a chapter on efforts to, to transform the valley into a transportation corridor, namely the development of the Don Valley Parkway in the 1950s and 60s. But of course, that transportation corridor had a longer history. I conclude my final chapter with an analysis of current plans to transform the mouth of the Don and, and how um, the valley's history has informed these very current plans to improve the river once again. So I'll just, I'll just conclude this little, this little prelude to my talk by saying that um, what I found in my research on the Don over these, these few years it took to produce this dissertation was that even though this is a very small urban river, it had a huge significance in the city's development. It was in its early years a supplier of commodities, and then, less obviously, per, but perhaps more importantly, a very important sink for the city's wastes. So it becomes this 
um, place that receives um, the things that we would rather have out of sight and out of mind. Um, so in that shift from center to periphery, the river moves from being a central provider of lumber, of clay, of water power, to essentially a place for waterborne pollutants and landfill. It becomes an example of how forgotten or waste places within the cities, within cities like Toronto, um, including Toronto, can provide important urban, ecological, and socioeconomic services as cities develop. <laughs> it, urban in the sense of these hidden services, such as um, drainage of floodwaters, sinks for waste, ecological in the sense of providing a corridor for wildlife movement, for example. Um, and social economic as a place of refuge and subsistence for people pushed to the edges of society. And that's where I'd like to discuss tonight. I also talked about the dawn as a site of imagined futures for the city. So from John Grave Simcoe's plans to locate his future town of York at the base of, of the Don River through to that glorious plans of the 1880s to make this an industrial hub and then to our current visions to renaturalize the river. The Don has frequently um, been at the center of those plans. <coughs> so overall, the city's relationship with the river, I found, was one of belated and inadequate response to worsening pollution typically when pressured by litigation or by provincial health authorities. So these are, that's kind of a, a broad um, overview of the larger project. So today I'd like to talk about the history of homelessness in the valley. This is, um, so today I'd like to talk about the history of homelessness in the valley and the connections between long accept, established perceptions of the valley as a waste space and its role as a receiving area, not only for undesirable substances such as sewage and industrial pollutants, but also undesirable human populations. I think most of you here are probably fairly familiar with the Don River watershed, just in case I have any people from outside the city. A few slides just to represent that watershed. So, pretty small river we're dealing with here, 38 kilometers long from its headwaters um, to its mouth in Toronto Harbor consisting of the lower Don um, and then those two, up, those two branches in the upper um, valley, as well as a third branch, Taylor Massey Creek, joining the river also at the forks. So the, the talk I'm going to, to give tonight, I'll start by talking about pollutants, and then I'll talk about a series of institutions that established north of Girard Street in the 1860s, and then I'll outline um, selected episodes in the history of homelessness in the valley, starting with a story about the Brooks Bush Gang of the 1860s to evidence of Roma encampments or gypsy encampments in the valley in the 1910s and 20s. And then finally, I'll talk about the hobo jungle that appeared on the river flats near the Don Valley Brickworks in 1930 and 1931. So as I've suggested, when the settlement of York first begins in the 1790s, the Don is construed as a space that was very central to the, to the development of the town of York. Simcoe's John Grave Simcoe, the lieutenant governor, situates his town plot right near the mouth of, of the Don, just west of the Don River, actually. And this is a, a later map, but this is the area I'm talking about. This shows um, the later development of the growing city of Toronto by 1818. As you can see, this is Tattle Creek coming down here, and this is um, the very circuitous and former uh, Lower Don River. So, in the grand scheme of things, he's, he's located in a, in a very wet um, and marshy area, the, the future town of York, his original town plot. He, on a reconnaissance expedition to the area in the spring of 1793, Simcoe saw in the sheltered curve of Toronto Bay and its tributary streams a landscape of possibility. He noted the harbour's natural defensibility and its potential to supply the future town of York with lumber. And he wrote to um, the, the acting colonial administrator of the time and said, at the bottom of the harbour there is a situation admirably suited for a naval arsenal and a dockyard and there flows into the harbour a river, the Don, um, the banks of which are covered with excellent timber. So this is 1793, seeing this river as a source of great potential. Simcoe had his surveyor, Alexander Aitken, lay out a plot for the future town of York just west of the mouth at the foot of today's Parliament Street. 
And in this image, um, this is a fantastic map if you ever have a chance to see the entire thing. Um, it's available online. Uh, you can get it through the Toronto Public Library system. But here we see uh, uh, the, the, the mouth of the dog coming down here, Tallow Creek. And this is where Sipco situates both his reserve for government houses for, for the for future parliament, right at the foot of, of Parliament Street. Um, he also sets aside a 400-acre government reserve west of the river, so stretching north to, to today's Carlton Street and west to Parliament. <coughs> and this reserve would um, remain forested for some time before it was developed. That's a, that's a larger story. So the Don being significantly the site of the city's first, first Parliament buildings. Simcoe also awards prominent men in his circle, um, farm lots in the Lower Valley. Um, he takes a farm lot himself in the name of his son Francis. And we should remember in all of this that Simcoe's stay at York was very brief. And his decisions were based on necessarily hasty assessments of the economic and strategic potential of, Tro of Toronto Bay. It seems he miscalculated perhaps the influence of the wide shallow marsh, which you can see um, off to the right of the image here, stretching south and east of the river mouth on the health, on the health of York's future inhabitants. And I'll be returning to the subject of the marsh at the mouth of the Don as we progress. So nevertheless, the river did provide, um, as he anticipated, it did serve as a source for lumber, for clay, and for water power um, well into the 19th century. But the problems that came with those provisions were perhaps balanced out by, by the great sources of, the, of um, fuel for developing the city they did provide. The watershed did become, by the mid-19th century, very significant um, for water-powered mills. So at the peak of water-powered milling in 1860, the watershed supported over 50 mills producing paper, lumber, flour, and wool, most of these saw and grist mills. All of these mills congregated along the upper reaches of the river where the gradients were higher and the flow rates were faster. And the furthest south were um, the Todd Morden Mills, or the Don Mills as they were known at the time, located at the first fall in ascending the river. So this is an image of the Taylor brothers come to purchase three mills along the Don around the area of the Forks, and this being the furthest south. And as Toronto historian Gary Medema has pointed out, these mills today have a very picturesque and somewhat romantic feel, but at the time they would have been very noisy places, um, very precarious places, and that they were so dependent upon the flow rates of a very small river in this case. So um, a dry summer or an unexpected flood could wipe out these early mill owners, and periodically did. So beyond that, we also have the hidden issue of sawdust, which was such a deadly polluter for rivers um, in this period. So the amount of sawdust that, that these sawmills produced, it would simply be typically dropped through the floor of the mill into the river below. Sawdust would accumulate and essentially create an anaerobic blanket that laid over the bottom of the river, wiping out spawning grounds for fish, and sucking up oxygen. The effects of sawdust at the time, there's been some historical work on this, was, was quite pronounced. And this is an, an early example of just the effects of this early industry on, on the dawn. An example of this, the last Atlantic salmon was reputedly speared at Taylor Mills, um, here, at their mill down near Pottery Road in 1874. So Atlantic salmon were once very populous in Lake Ontario and up the Don. The Don was one of the um, spawning rivers and there's some wonderful images of people, in both native and early settlers, spearing great quantities of salmon in the, mid in the mid 19th century before these mills really began to take effect. So it wasn't only sawdust, but also mill machinery and mill dams that made it very difficult for salmon to continue their life cycle. So what I've wanted to establish here is the Don as a significant force in the development of York in its early years, between about 1793 and 1830. After that, things really begin to change, and that's where we'll go from here. So I'm leaping wildly ahead 
<laughs> just to give you an image to put in your minds, not so much to think about the date, but to think about ravine lands as dumping grounds. Okay, so in the latter half of the 19th century, the river valley becomes increasingly peripheral to the center. It becomes that place at the eastern edge of the city. And it, <coughs> coinciding with this, it becomes increasingly polluted. There are a number of factors at work here. Like other ravines around the world, the Don Valley had long been used as a dumping ground for urban refuge, a convenient repository for urban waste created by the shape of those ravines, a convenient place to fill. Um, filling also conveniently removed barriers to development, so by filling up these basin-type spaces, you created um, ground upon which to develop, so this was a good thing for all concerned. So topography played a role, but also location. The Lower Dawn, as you can see in this image, formed the eastern boundary of the city until annexations in the 1880s. So it was the edge, and it was treated as an edge, as a margin, in terms of the place that you tip things off the side of the city into. It was a space to put things out of the public eye. From the mid-19th century on, industries are increasingly attracted to the lower river. So I talked earlier about... <laughs> Milling sites in the upper watershed dependent on faster river flow. In the latter half of the 19th century, you start to see that milling begin to decline. And what happens is we have more and more industries attracted to the lower river, mainly as um, a place not so much for needing water power from fast moving water, but you have this wonderful conduit to take away your waste immediately outside your door. So some of the industries attracted to the river included tanneries. William Smith's tannery um, established on the east side of the river, south of Queen Street, then the Kingston Road, in 1820, so fairly early on. Tanneries was, were, of course, notoriously smelly operations and a location removed from residential and commercial districts would have saved a man like William Smith from the complaints of his neighbours. His operations expanded several times, and he closed in the 1840s. And I'm sorry I don't have an image of Smith's tannery. But he was followed by a number of other tanning operations, including Bickle and Wicket Tannery, which established in 1881 and operated as late as 1990, and the A.R. Clark and Company Tannery, which also operated into the 1990s. So very recent um, and lengthy histories in the Lower, in the lower Dawn. Among the other so-called noxious industries that located in the valley um, were abattoirs. And uh, William Davies' pork packing plant, perhaps the most famous of these, established in the 1860s. They relocate from Front and Frederick, Frederick Street and move to the Front and the Don River in 1879. Davies um, creates a huge ice house to, create, to bring ice from the river, from the Don River and the harbour. He's the first in Canada to install an artificial refrigeration unit in 1891, and from this he can really grow his operations. At one time, William Davies was the largest pork packer in Canada. He merges with three other abattoirs to become Canada Packers in 1927. So, huge and significant pork packing plant along the Lower Don. And some of the uh, companion project to my dissertation was trying to track just when these kind of industries established in the lower river, what kinds of industries and what was their footprint. So this is a, an image from a companion GIS project or geographic information systems. And what we did was we not only mapped all of the different industry that occurred in the valley in different years and when they opened, when they closed, but in this case we actually tried to track the actual physical footprint of those buildings. And so here you can see just at the bend before this becomes um, a, a right angle turn, the former bend in the river uh, in the 1890s. I, you'll see good urban warts here, and I'll explain that in a minute, why they're included um, in animal processing. Uh, there, there's a very good reason. Uh, but you see a sheepskin tannery located further north, and then these large operations, A.R. Clark and Company, Bickle and Wicket, and William Davies pork packing on the, on the west side of the river. Among the other industries that are attracted to the lower river in the latter half of the 19th century included breweries, such as the Don Brewery at River, north of Queen, um, which established in 1834. Um, it was purchased by Thomas Davies in 1849 and operated until 1901. 
I'm not sure why I have a date of 1877 here. Um, Gooderman Warts, of course. Um, soap factories and oil refineries are among the many diverse kinds of industries that locate here. You'll notice a trend in that most of these could be considered rather noxious in their, in their smells, in their site, the kinds of sites they produce, um, and in the kinds of, of byproducts to their industry. For example, um, oil refineries, one of the, the largest byproducts was gasoline. And in this case, companies like British American Oil were simply dumping byproduct gas directly into Ashbridge's Bay Marsh. So both flammable materials and hazardous waste store, or hazardous materials storage, excuse me, such as coal and lumber, also found um, a lot of ground in the Lower Dawn, in that this was a place not only to put things that smelled bad or looked bad, it was also a place to put things that might pose a danger to surrounding residences, so things that might catch on fire. And when you look to the... Um, when you, when you map this industrial footprint and look to, you know, yards and yards of storage materials, of potentially hazardous materials next to oil refineries, soap works, these kind of constellations of industry that depended on each other in ways that soap works depended on tanneries for those associated products that they used. So by 1886, we had four tanneries and two soap works clustered around the, a constellation of slaughterhouses, packing and rendering plants along the bank of the river south of Gerard. Nuisance bylaws and early 20th century zoning did play a role here. Uh, noxious industries and hazardous material storage were pushed to the edges of the settlement um, for, for reasons of fire hazard and other things. The other, another thing that played a big role was the extension of rail across e the eastern waterfront um, in the 1850s. This was certainly a stimulus to area industry. By 1857, for example, the, um, the Grand Trunk Railway had constructed a number of workshops, depots, and a station at the eastern end of Front Street, west of the river mouth. And rail traffic, of course, also brought new concentrations of hazardous materials, such as the extensive coal yards located around the GTR depot, and related industries such as the Toronto Rolling Mills, established in 1858. So just, to, just a, a historical note in that the area around the Lower Don had long been used for hazardous material storage. The earliest maps you can find of the area um, show things like a powder magazine, a place to, so to store gunpowder on the peninsula near the mouth of the Don. So these flammable items have long been stored in this sort of in-between space that was difficult to develop for various reasons. Of course, all of these industries led to um, extremely polluted conditions. Again, I'm cheating and stealing an image from the 1960s to talk about pollution, but here I have, I don't have a lot of images of pollution from the 1890s. Try to imagine, instead of just phosphorus pollution, floating uh, you know, carcasses and sewage waste and all sorts of horrible things that found their way into the dawn in this period. The, the pollution was especially concentrated in the lower reaches of the river that were so serpentine and marshy. So sewage concentrated in this area and residents complained, as we shall see. One resident commented in a letter to the Daily Glo Globe in 1874, the water and the marsh at the mouth of the Don continues to be filled with a foul combination of wastes so that whenever the wind sets to a particular quarter and agitates the water, the result is an abominable smell injurious to the comfort and the health of all within its reach. Cattle wastes from the Gooderman Wartz cattle buyers were a particularly notorious polluter of the area. Remember I'd shown you Gooderman Wartz among those animal processing a categorized industry of, of animal processors and you might think why is a whiskey producer being listed um, as an animal processor well Gruderman Wurtz found a very convenient way to produce even greater revenue and what they found was they could use the byproducts um, from their whiskey production to fatten pigs and to fatten cattle and so they did this to great, to great degree. I think Gooderman began fattening cattle and hogs in the late 1830s, and by 1841 he'd established a large dairy on a nine-acre site between Trinity and Cherry Streets across from his mill. So his main concentration of waste then became not grain residue, but hog and cattle manure. And where does he put this? in Tashbridge's Bay Marsh. And a lot of it is funneled as liquid waste directly into the marsh. And he actually ends up moving his operations 
his cattle operations, um, I think this is 1893, so his, his cattle buyers are now located just east of the, of the um, bend in the river and north of the marsh. And before he had done that, though, he had created a, an underground pipe that would take those wastes directly into the, into the marsh. So um, complaints by area residents begin to accumulate from about the 1870s on. Um, so think of that volatile cocktail of gasoline, cattle manure, um, floating carcasses and, and, and offal from slaughterhouses and tanneries, brewing wastes and soap factory wastes, it's hard for us to imagine today. So, as I said, he, he constructs this pipeline to, to bring, I'm sorry, it was to bring gr- grain swill from the distillery to the cattle sheds east of the river. But indeed, the, the manure was running right into the marsh. <clears throat> sewage pollution also added to this cocktail, and the extension of the sewage system east in the 1880s and 90s resulted in several outfalls into the Don. And before that, street side drainage ditches would have carried waste into the Don and other creeks from about the 1830s on. In 1894, this is when we start to have residents begin to complain. An article in the Toronto Mail described the Lower River as a pestilential channel whose waters had taken on a, quote, yellowish-green color and a slimy, soup-like consistency. The river's deadly um, condition, the article concluded, arises from the fact that the sewage from a large district is constantly being poured into it. Conditions... Conditions resulted in threats of lawsuits against the city to deal with the problem and and an intervention by the Provincial Board of Health in in the early 1890s due to the threat of cholera. So this looming threat of cholera and the Provincial Board of Health nudges the city and says, you really have to deal with this problem. It leads them to um, dredge what's known as Keating Cut, and this is an east-west channel through the marsh parallel to the lakeshore. And the idea was it would create some um, movement of water which would pull all of these wastes, presumably, um, and move them out into the lake. This was um, one of a long series of plans that largely fail. And I'm I'm not going to get into that today. That's another talk. So on top of this cocktail by the 1890s, the area also had a longer history of undesirability for multiple reasons. The marsh itself had associations with the risk of disease dating from the very earliest days of settlement and that it was thought that miasmas would emanate from the marsh, which were, miasmas were the idea that you could actually contract disease by inhaling the vapors of rotting organic materials. So you can imagine, (laughs) Ashbridge's Bay Marsh was not a place you wanted to spend if you believed in this form of, of contracting disease, and this was certainly widespread. As early as the 1830s, you see evidence of the city really moving away from its, its early roots at the base of the Don and moving in a northwest direction. Other factors were at work. It was certainly a difficult place to develop with these great yawning ravines that needed to be bridged. It's few and unreliable bridges, reputedly poor soils for agricultural purposes, and just the very unpredictability of the riparian environment. And that This was an area subject to flood risks, a number of factors working against popularity and desirability for real estate in the Lower Don, one of them being just the horrible pollutedness of this area. So by the mid-19th century, you start to see a distinct shift in the land ownership patterns in the Lower Valley. Once the location of, of country estates and farm lots of York's more prominent inhabitants, the area is increasingly working class by the late 19th century with the growth of these area industries. So... Now that I've discussed the valley as a place for, for um, physical undesirables, for, for material undesirables in the, in the form of pollutants and industrial wastes, I'd like to turn to talking about it as a place for human undesirables. Research in, into the human use of the valley over time, my research, revealed patterns with some interesting parallels. So in the 1850s and 60s, I wanted to draw your attention to three institutions that develop um, along the Lower River between Girard and Bloor. The first being the Toronto General Hospital, which relocates from its former site at King and John to a four-acre site bounded by Girard, Sackville, Sumac, and Spruce, just west of the Don in 1855. In 1860, on the other side of the river, the directors of the Toronto Magdalen Asylum opened the Industrial House of Refuge, 
And this is to provide shelter and reform for the poor, the mentally ill, and the homeless, um, referred to in other terms at the time. And finally, in 1865, after a series of setbacks, including a, a devastating fire, the Toronto jail opens just south of the House of Refuge on the east side of the river. At the time of their establishment, each of these institutions lay beyond the city boundaries in the liberties east of Parliament Street, which were later incorporated into the city. And in the case of the jail and the House of Refuge across the river, they were, they were located in the county of York. So once again, on that, that marginal area at the city edge. The rationale for locating them here was, was a lot, large part due to cheaper land, particularly in the case of the Toronto General Hospital, which hoped to raise revenue by moving to a cheaper location and then renting out the former. Its agricultural present potential in the case of the jail farm associated with the, the Don Jail. And certainly ide 19th century ideas of the countryside as a more virtuous and wholesome environment to fulfill goals of isolating and reforming troublesome populations. So just to point out, this is the area around Girard. It's, it's north of that really horribly polluted area um, around Ashbridge's Bay Marsh. But it nevertheless is subject to, certainly in the thoughts of the time, drifting miasmas um, along with prevailing winds could bring threats of disease, for example, to um, the inmates in these institutions. So there was certainly a lot of debate about locating them along the Don, but nevertheless, this is where they find themselves. This pattern of isolating sources of danger, of corruption or disease over the dawn and outside the city limits continues into the 20th century. And the House of Refuge is later converted into an isolation hospital during the smallpox epidemics of the 1870s. And as a local historian has recalled, it was known to local children as the pest house. Um, visitors to a loved one could come only so close to the grounds from which point they would have to throw their gifts to those on the inside. In the early 1900s, the Riverdale Isolation Hospital is constructed on the same site. A second isolation hospital known as the Swiss Cottage Hospital opens on the west side of the valley in the same period, in the early 1800s. And in World War II, a prisoner of war labor camp um, opens further north in Todd M Morden Mills. This is a satellite camp to the larger internment camp at Mimico, and the camp mainly housed German merchant sailors who labored at the nearby Toronto Brickworks, today's um, Don Valley Brickworks. And uh, we see here a similar rationale to the Don Jail and the industrial farm, proximity to a site for labor, in this case um, the Brickworks, and relative remove from the curious eyes of onlookers and potential avenues of escape. Although there are some great stories of escape from this, uh, um, from, of prisoners of war through the Don Valley, if you track the newspaper coverage of that time. So alongside this institutional history is a long history of homelessness in the valley, and that's what I'd like to turn to now. Henry Scadding, 19th century Toronto historian, described one of the early residents of the Lower Dawn, a man named Joseph Tyler. And he talked about his house as an excavation in the side of a steep hill a little way above the level of the river bank. The flue of his winter fireplace was a tubular channel, bored up through the clay of the hillside. To the south of his cave, he cultivated a large garden and raised, among other things, the, sweet, the white sweet edible Indian corn, a novelty here at the time, and very excellent tobacco. What I'd like to get at here is um, Joseph Tyler is an, a very early example of a very long trend. Um, the Lower Valley had a reputation through the 19th and 20th century as somewhat of an outlaw space. And here you can sense the potential for um, misdemeanor in just the, the, the fact that this was one of few remaining wooded areas in a larger agricultural landscape. So there was a scant police presence, we can certainly gather. For much of the 19th century, Toronto police jurisdiction extended only to the west bank of the Don. North of the Danforth Valley lands remained unincorporated until the early 20th century. So once again, the areas that fell in the county of York, east of the river, would have been likely very little monitored by, by the scant policing resources of York County. And of course, we have to remember that police surveillance differed substantially in the 19th century than it did from the active presence we're familiar with today. So there were fewer policemen, for one thing, and 
Police were mainly focused on suppressing rebellions and regulating working class behavior rather than looking to prevent crime as they might be today. So all sorts of, the, the stories here are quite wonderful in that um, when you start looking at things like taverns that locate in the, in the dawn in this period and the kinds of activities that happened in these taverns, keeping in mind that all forms of gaming, of gambling, were banned by provincial statute in the 19th, in, through much of the 19th century. And yet here in a place like the Don Vale House, things like boxing contests, cockfights, um, gambling, and dog fights routinely happened. So Don Vale House is one of those places. This is at um, Winchester Street on the west side of the river. And then Butcher's Arms Tavern. If any of you have read Ron Fletcher's Over the Dawn, which is this, this wonderful series of vignettes about the dawn, he talks about William Vine's Butcher's Arms as a place of rough sport for, that men would frequent to, to engage in. Okay. Moving from that sense of the dawn as kind of an outlaw space, I'd like to just talk briefly about the Brooks Bush Gang of the 1860s. Some of you may have heard about the Brooks Bush Gang. Um, there was, there's been a series of coverage in the newspapers of, of the period of, about a, a trial that happened. And I'll talk a bit about that. But there's also a great story in the Maclean's magazine of the 1920s which re, um, retells this story. So in December 1859, John Sheridan Hogan, who was a newspaperman and a local MPP, was murdered on the Queen Street Bridge, and his body was unceremoniously tossed into the river. His body was discovered in Ashbridge's Marsh 16 months later, a full year and four months later, in March of 1861 by some duck hunters. It seems his body had washed down river with the spring freshets of that season. The Brooks Bush Gang are blamed for his murder. And who were these people? They were, from what we can best gather, an amorphous group of 20 to 30 men and women who lived for periods in an abandoned barn in Brooks Bush, which was near the John Jail, as, as best we can attest. And here are, from, from my research, potential locations of Brooks Bush based on, on land um, ownership records of the time. John Wilson of the Task Force to Bring Back the Dawn actually thinks that Brooks Bush was located in today's Withrow Park, and it seems that I think his, his research is very um, suggestive that that might be the case. So they, they made use of outbuildings, of relationships with landowners at the time who would say, sure, you can sleep in my shed for the night. There was a lot of drinking involved, as you can imagine. Um, so they tended to live in the bush, over the spring and summer months and spent much of the rest of their lives in and out of the Don Jail, from what I can gather. So men and women, um, the, their numbers seem to vary. Most of the time they seem to be just harassing people walking down Queen Street, bugging them perhaps, making them feel a little uncomfortable. They're occasionally implicated in robberies and essentially being picked up for public drunkenness much of the time. The women occasionally for prostitution. But here we have a murder, and as a result of this murder, the trial record gives us a sneak peek into just who these people were in that their testimony is recorded through the trial record, and we can get a sense of, of just what they were doing in this space at the time. And through that, we find that many of them were working as seasonal farm workers. Some of them had, had been injured and could no longer work and end up finding refuge um, in the valley this way. Two of them are eventually... Um, tried and one, one of the gang members is hanged in 1862 for the murder of this MPP and the others are acquitted. And the trial is, when you read it, it seems they needed to pin it on somebody. The evidence is rather slight for the person who's actually hanged. But it it's, it's, gives a great sketch of what homelessness in the dawn looked like in the 1860s. And if you've read Ernest Thompson Seton, he refers to a similar sounding um, gang as responsible for destroying his um, cabin in the woods and his two little savages. He refers to gang members coming and, and vandalizing his creation. And so the Brooks Bush Gang continues to pop up in local lore well into the 1880s and 90s and, and well after they had probably disbanded, certainly after this trial. So moving from there um, to some examples of 20th century homelessness. So people who, of course, people who sought refuge in the Don Valley in different periods are largely absent from the historical record. 
marginalized groups typically don't leave records. And things like police, census enumerators, medical officers of health who report on conditions in Toronto typically didn't enter the valley. So officials weren't moving into the valley and these kind of people typically didn't write down their experiences. So this absence of scrutiny, the fact that census enumerators and policemen didn't typically enter the valley may have been one of the reasons that attracted people to this place in the first place. And reading the writings of Charles Sorrell, who I mentioned, he certainly references a long history of squatters and campers and so-called tramps and philosophers, in his words, that lived in the valley for short periods in the 20s and 40s. Two groups, however, of so-called undesirables received significant coverage in the Toronto newspapers. One of them were um, several groups of Roma immigrants, or, or otherwise known as gypsies, who camped in the valley in the 1910s and 20s. And the second were a group of unemployed men who formed a hobo jungle on the flats in, the 19, in 1930 and 31. So because I have records for them, that's who I'm going to speak about. The Roma first. In the early 20th century, with the industrialization of the, and the dawn improvement in the lower valley, what we thought of as rural was no longer that place around Riverdale Farm. It had shifted further north to areas you know, still capable of providing refuge on the Don were now in the upper valley rather than the lower valley. Um, so Roma, val Roma families camped in the valley in the early 20th century. And you'll notice that these photos are actually of the Humber. Roma groups camped in different parts of the city in this period. And the evidence I have, the photographic evidence I have is from the Humber. However, I have written evidence that they were also on the Don. So, in November 1910, a star, reported, um, a star reporter noted that there was a Roma campsite on the west branch of the Don um, at the end of today's Sudan Avenue near Eglinton and Bayview. Living in the camp, he said, were several families, two bears and a baboon, and they apparently derived their income from fortune-telling and exhibitions. The newspaper court coverage is, of course, laced with that prejudice and that curiosity for the very exotic that these people represented. It focused on their primitivity, on their domestic deficiencies, um, and when you see this, this following image, um, the, the coverage that accompanied these images talked about how the children are running around barefoot, they're making um, a very impromptu dinner of potatoes and eggs, how could this possibly be enough is the, is the, is the suggestion. This group at Sudan Avenue apparently responded um, to the protests of area residents by actually purchasing the property, which is, which is an interesting twist. Evidence suggests, however, that the complaints led to their deportation to the U.S. in, in the following year in 1911. It's, it's all very sketchy history that I'm pulling together from newspaper records of the time, but it's, it's very difficult to follow these people, as you might gather. This is a location of the two camps that I found. Um, the one in 1910, further down just below Eglinton, and the other at Young and York Mills in 1920. So that second Roma camp was a group of eight so-called Serbian gypsy families that had occupied a site further up river, as I've noted, on the west branch of the Don near Young and York Mills. This was a roadside location. It was right beside Young Street, and it seems people were making their living by selling used car parts and telling fortunes. Again, the coverage suggests that group later moved on. So what I'm finding here is that the river valleys were providing both refuge from, from authorities as well as a source of subsistence and livelihood. So when you look at the, at the um, newspaper coverage, it talks about women cooking, taking water from the river, bathing in the river, using driftwood for cooking fires, um, fishing in the river even, and using grasses to weave baskets to sell <coughs> in the city below. So the river becomes an important provider in a different way than we saw earlier um, for these groups who are certainly pushed to the edges, I would suggest. I'd like to conclude with a discussion of um, the Depression-era hobo jungle that forms in 1930 and 31. So in fall 1930, a group of about 30 men find refuge in the Toronto Brickworks. They become known as the kiln dwellers in that they slept on so-called hot flops, and these were... Um, beds of recently prepared bricks that were still hot from the kiln and would take some time to cool off. So it could take up to a week for some of these bricks to fully lose their heat. And men who were down on their luck made use of them 
by sleeping by sleeping there at night. Their their source of shelter at the Brickworks was with um, the complicity of the Brickworks manager at the time, who welcomed them in and provided them shelter. And in fact, that manager um, drove away some plainclothes policemen who were seeking to have these police these men move on. So, why are they here? Why are they in the valley? Well, certainly, the role of the railway is important here in bringing them in. It seems there was a tacit agreement with police that if you hopped off before you actually got into the center, that they would turn their eye the other way. So if you if you sought refuge as an unemployed man, not right in the downtown core, um, but in a place that wouldn't be um, so in line of view of city residents, that they wouldn't bother you. So it's interesting to note that unlike the Roma, these men are not per, um, portrayed as... as um, exotic outsiders, but instead as, as decent men down in their luck. This was a temporary homelessness. By August 1931, there were 400 men in the valley, 100 sleeping in the brickworks, and 300 in shanties and sleeping uh, in shanties and all along the banks of the river. And these are some images, unfortunately, they're not that clear. They're from um, the East York Foundation collection, which shows just some of those Shanties. They were known as the cave, the cave dwellers or the shack dwellers, and that they sometimes carved caves into uh, the, the soft soils around the river. So much like Joseph Tyler um, of the 1830s. Again, we see that the river provided. It provided water for cooking and bathing. It provided saplings for hut construction and driftwood for campfires. Plus, things like discarded objects from area landfill sites. Um, show up in these men's shacks and that they would find something like a, a, a discarded radio aerial, for example, or, or a broken kerosene lamp and try to fix things to make their life in this period a little better. Uh, a touring, um, Reverend Peter Bryce goes in on a tour of the valley and of the Hobo Jungle in August 31, 1931. And he says that some men slept in boxcars and dugouts, others fashioned, he said, most ingenious huts bivouacs of rushes bound together by striplings sewn through with thatch. Um, these men are the object of a lot of concern by Toronto residents and they receive donations of food and clothing from women's organizations especially and church organizations. And some of the artifacts that exist from this period include this great um, cardboard, a photo of this cardboard card of thanks from the men of the Don Flats to those who had donated um, food and clothing for their sustenance. Um, the card of thanks reads, this is to say that we dwellers of the Don Flats, otherwise known as the cave and shack dwellers, do hereby wish to thank all those who have tried to help us out in any way, and particularly those kind enough to send any supplies by way of food left over from picnics, which might have otherwise gone to waste and we'll be glad to accept in future any kindness that this notice may happen to bring us. And it's signed with eight signatures. So nevertheless, the, the, um, the hobo camp exists for about a year and a half, but concerns about communist agitation begin to build and center around the Don Valley camp in particular. And they lead to warnings in the conservative newspapers that, quote, all drifters should be cleared out of the city before winter. As the Depression worsened, numbers of, the numbers of men increased, and the mayors of Toronto and East York vowed to crack down on outsiders seeking relief within their sin city limits. So these are no longer the respectable men down in their luck, but now an alien threat to the city's stability. So just shifting the perception of who these men were and what they sought over this period of time. In late September 1931, the province announced that 2,500 unemployed men would be drafted from southern Ontario to work on the Trans-Canada Highway project in northern Ontario. And by early October, the jungle shanties had been, been demolished by local police and the residents transferred to, to northern camps or removed to temporary shelters. The men apparently fared very well for their ordeal. Um, of the 213 men examined by doctors, only three were rejected as unfit for hard labor. In conclusion, I'd like to suggest that for both... Um, the, the Roma and the Hobos, the valley provided. It provided refuge from authorities and access to amenities. With that increased industrialization, as I noted, we see that refuge space shifting further north, as I've suggested. And I think it's the ambiguity of these spaces that makes them attractive. 
Um, so because they're polluted or so otherwise undesirable, they're difficult landscapes and the steep ravines of the valley, the marshy lowlands of the lower Don. As a result, the valley presents an open space unattractive to residents of the center. The lack of surveillance in this area is also, I think, significant in its function as a repository for so-called undesirables. Both temporary campers and long-term squatters could feel somewhat removed from a discernible landowner, and this is important. I'd like to suggest that people were not marginal in the same ways. People were placed in the valley in the case of these institutions, such as the Don Jail and the House of Refuge. This is a very different from those who chose it as a site of refuge, such as the Brooks Bush Gang or the Roma or the Hobos. Nevertheless, they all share the same status as so-called society's losers, more or less. From the 1960s on, um, as many of you are familiar, the valley is revalued as a recreational landscape. Metro Toronto puts massive investments to improve sewage infrastructure, for example, and this makes these new parklands after Hurricane Hazel more and more desirable because they no longer smelled so bad. Um, so with these changes to making this place more of a place for picnickers than for squatters, we see a shift in how the valley is perceived by local residents. In some respects, though, of course, not much has changed. Makeshift tents of the homeless can still be seen on the banks of the river in the lower valley, this being one of them. And as recently as the spring of 2008, the city used the valley as a receptacle for huge amounts of filthy salt laced snow from the city's roads. So just as it did in the mid-19th century, the, the valley continues to provide hidden services to the city. It's a sink for waste. Um, treated effluent from the North Toronto sewage treatment plant, for example, still spills into the Don. Um, it's a drainage for floodwaters. It's a corridor for wildlife. It's a refuge for homeless people. Um, and in serving all of these functions, I'd like to close with, I think you could argue that it makes the city that much more habitable in um, taking away these things that people would rather have um, outside their line of sight, one could argue. So I'll close there. Thank you. You've been listening to a recording of Jennifer Bennell's talk, Isolating Undesirables, Prisons, Pollution, and Homelessness in Toronto's Don River Valley, 1860-1932. Please check back on activehistory.ca in the near future for recordings of subsequent talks from the History Matters Lecture Series.